What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. As always, please hit that subscribe button. As y'all know, it's right down there and it's free. That enables us to keep coming to you guys as often as possible with as many interviews as possible with as many icons of the game as possible. So please hit that subscribe button. If you're so inclined, you can also hit us on Cash App, Unique Access ENT. And we appreciate your guys' support in getting us here, getting us this far. Now today, we have the honor and the privilege being joined by someone I'm anxious to talk to. And this is a great moment for us here at Unique Access, Ms. Patty Astor. Thank you for coming through. Thank you, Soren. Hello, everyone. This is a big thrill. I just want to say this is a big thrill for me because um, actually the source was the first um, national publication to give Wild Style um, play a review. So yeah, payback uh, time. Yeah. Well, I used to I used to work for them, be one of the main editors there, and obviously a fan of your work. But You've done a lot more than Wild Style. So, yes, we're going to talk about that. But I want to ask you about a lot of other stuff, including Underground USA, the nice poster you have behind you. But um, so were you originally born in Cincinnati? Actually, I was an army baby and um, was born in uh, Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C. My uh, dad was in the army. Um, he was a physician um, and my mom was on the my mother was a doctor also. And she was on the ambulance crew at Washington General. And then they moved to Cincinnati when I was five and I grew up there. Yeah, well, at, being from Maryland, I'm very familiar with Walter Reed. So, <laughs> yes. My uh, grandfather had been there as a veteran himself. So yes, very familiar. Um, so how did you end up from Cincinnati getting to New York and when did that actually happen? Well, my dad was from upstate New York and he was always, and so, you know, he was a big jazz man and, um, you know, he was graduated or he was in the, the fast break uh, college class of Princeton that graduated in 44, but they would always go down, you know, take the train down to see Benny Goodman and all of the big bands and stuff and get the jazz in New York. So it was always, oh, New York, New York. And um, I, you know, I became, you know, I, I wanted to be an actress and of course you have to go to New York. Yes. So what, given that your parents were not in that line of work. What what were their thoughts? Well, my father was um, a, a huge uh, film. That's one of the reasons why I became so interested in, particularly, you know, the no the new wave film and everything. Because my dad loved film, and I had a lot of opportunity to see films that at the time you would never see. Um, he played, uh, he rented a 16 millimeter projector and the film Belle du Jour and showed it in our living room when it was when in 1962 and it came out and I was 12. And so there's <laughs> little, uh, little uh, you know, when I would go and met Amos Poe at CBGB's in 1976 and we started making punk rock versions of John luc Godard films. There was a little, you know, circular motion there. Yes. Well, speaking of, speaking of that, uh, as society, I think, has evolved, uh, I want to get your opinion on this because with music, with acting, with art, you not only have a lot of hobbies and interests, but things you've done professionally and you've been doing them, you know, for decades. So now that I think we've had, we have a weird mix of people are like, oh, you have to focus on one thing. So in your mentality growing up and then getting into the art world, acting, different things, music, did you ever think like, oh, I have to really focus on one thing or were you always like, I'm going to do everything I want to do regardless? Well, I think that there's two things that I did learn growing up. One was that you, my parents really installed in me that you can do anything you want to, as long as you work hard enough to achieve it. And also, um, always leave your, uh, yourself open to new experiences. I mean, the whole art thing, the fun gallery was a total accident. I mean, it was just this party that started in my dumpy up tenement apartment on East Third Street and just never left. And so with Bill Stelling, who I knew from the Mud Club, said uh, to me at um, one university place, by the way, um, 
you know, Patty, I've got this little studio on East 11th Street and I fixed it up as an art gallery. Do you know any artists? I said, yeah, I got about 20 of them sleeping on my floor right now and I'd love to get rid of them. So let's go for it. Okay. <laughs> and that's how the fun gallery started. Now, what's the chronology of that? And then you getting into the into acting, were they happening around the same time? No, oh, no, no. The reason why, the, the actually the reason why the Fun Gallery was so successful and how I met Fab Five Freddy was, um, as I said, I made my first movie in 1976. I was cast out of CBGB's because we moved, Eric Mitchell and I moved to New York um, to pursue our film production and acting um, dreams. And so he found out that there was, he says, Patty, there's this place in the East Village called the East Village. It's very cheap over there. Um, and so I said, he said, we should move over there and get apartments. I said, okay. And all my friends said, um, well, that's a, that's fine. But, you know, first of all, you're going to get killed over there. And secondly, we're not coming to see you. So goodbye. I said, goodbye. And uh, so we moved over and then we just, CBGB's was the only really bar in town there. Uh, literally, uh, there was the Russian bars and then there was the um, drug dens. But so everybody kind of went. It was the, kind of the neighborhood bar. It just happened that the bands in the neighborhood bar were Blondie and the Talking Heads. And so there we met Amos Poe, who had, do, had just, just done the uh, Blank Generation, which is a very, very an excellent movie that uh, shows all the bands. Early, uh, early on in 75 at CBGB's. And so he started, he wanted to make movies. So he cast me in Unmade Beds, which is a punk rock ripoff of Breathless, John Luke Godard's, one of his most famous films. And, um, and it was starring Debbie Harry. And I said, oh yeah, my first movie and it's starring Debbie Harry, I've made it. And you know what, I was right. Yeah, well. You did a lot of great work soon thereafter as well. So. Yeah, so then then the whole un independent, so this is 76, and this is way before, you know, the whole art thing didn't really start until like 78, 80, really. Okay. And um, so in that period, in that time period, we did the new cinema, and I made about 12 films. And so by the time that Fab Five hit the scene and John michelle and, you know, Keith and all the guys, you know, I was already a celeb time. And so um, it was, that was what drew Fab to seek me out. As a matter of fact, the Fab dragged, Underground USA was running as the midnight movie at the St. Mark's Cinema. For it ran for six months. Um, Eric and I used to, this is when we were living on East Third Street across from the men's shelter in these really dumpy, horrible $65 a month apartments. Everybody lived there. Tina Lahotsky, John Lurie, Bill Rice. A lot of people lived on that street because they were so cheap. It was Street of Stars. So Eric and I would like, when Underground USA was playing at St. Mark's Cinema, Eric and I would put on disguises. <laughs> Wow. And go up and check out how long the line was. It was long. And so Fab decided, meanwhile, independently, um, Fab decided that it was time to bring hip hop to the world. And so he did. And he came down to the East Village and saw Underground USA, a great starting point. He brought um, Futura and somebody else, I think. Futura told me he didn't get it and he fell asleep. I thought, that's okay. And um, but then the next day, um, another East Village luminary, poet, philosopher, Duncan Smith, was holding a 100th birthday party or maybe 200th birthday party for the poet, Stephen Mallarmé. So we went and um, had vodka and cucumber sandwiches and for tea. And Fred was there. I'm, I think he probably came with Diego Cortez, as a matter of fact. Um, and it was kind of an unusual sight, you know, you see this tall black guy with the shades and the pork pie hat at that time, you know, downtown, uh, I was like, who is that guy? And Fred walked up to me and since it was a birthday 
birthday party there with the little paper cake plates. And he walked up to me and he said, Patty Astor, you're my favorite movie star. Can I have your autograph? And I said, well, sure. You must be my new best friend. And that was the start of it. Interesting. <laughs> That's crazy. Now, but with Underground USA and even the stuff you had done before that, I think it's uh, remarkable and a testament to what you guys were able to do with the independent guerrilla filmmaking that you were able to do that 12 films, but you just said it so casually. So as you're making these films and since they were low budget guerrilla and they emphasize different things than a traditional studio film, what, what were you as an actor, what were your kind of goals or objectives or were you just long for the ride? What were you, what was going through your mind creatively? Well, both Eric and I were, you know, we knew what we were doing. Uh, I mean, we had studied film, you know, it was, that was our, that was our profession. A, few, a lot of the other people, you know, that were great in the films were rock musicians um, and, you know, so on. And they, you know, did what they could do. And many of them were very good in those films. Um, but uh, we were, you know, I mean, we know we were serious about it. It wasn't, I mean, we were using uh, Super 8. We shot on Super 8 for quite a few of the films. It's beautiful. And either it takes little lighting or most of them were natural lighting. And um, the direct, you know, the, it was, it was serious. It wasn't like the home movies or it wasn't like what people are doing now where there's just so much, I mean, we were, you know, wanted to make, you know, real movies. And we found out that we could do this cheaply. And then we did move to 16 millimeter underground shot in 16. There was this guy, <laughs> guy on Canal Street who had the, he sold like, uh, you know, 60 millimeter cameras that came out of somewhere. I have a feeling probably NYU back door that he would sell very cheaply. And then you would also buy, this is the other thing too, is that you would shoot with ends, film ends, which is like so archaic. But there was like, if there was film left in the cans, you could buy that for practically nothing. And this is for 16. And um, so, but I'm a one take wonder. You never, you never took more than one take unless the camera fell over because we were, you had to develop it. And with the Super 8 films, um, you can only shoot those. You can't really show them. So they would shoot them, edit them on the little movieola thing. And then we, this was a new thing that was coming up was we transferred them to video. And Eric established a theater on St. Mark's Place called the New Cinema where a lot of our films ran and other filmmakers as well. And um, you could transfer the Super 8 to video. And it was also at the same time, Dan Soteria pioneered uh, the video camera, the video lounge and all that. So they could be shown on the club's screens and they showed all over the world that way, so. Well, well that all of that is a testament to my question because I think now people, because of the ease of cell phones, they think, oh, that's how we've always made movies because they don't understand or appreciate the <clears throat> work, especially doing things on a low budget shoestring operation that you guys would have had to been going through getting the camera and the different types of film and the stock and processing. And then of course you need a cast and a script. It's just a bigger thing than I think people appreciate nowadays. So I was just curious about that. Um, and then with Underground USA, uh, what was the Sunset Boulevard correlation or inspiration or influence, if any, that you saw? Well, I think, you know, that um, with this whole thing of, you know, because we were very, we were the next generation after the Warhol generation. Like when we first, like with, you know, Eric and me and Duck and Hannah was another big hanger and my husband, Stephen Kramer, we were kind of this group that, 
you know, we started like running around. I mean, we go, we would go to the big Soho art openings for um, free drinks and to see if there were Warhol stars there, you know, because we were always like, oh, we want to see, you know, we want to see Andy and we want to see Viva and all these people. So, we, But they were the generation that was sort of right before us. And then there was, of course, the correlation with Edie Sedgwick, you know, I mean, the whole Warhol thing was all about, you know, the, the, the fallen superstar and um, that kind of thing. And so is Sunset Boulevard. So that's kind of our combo okay. of um, that story. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. A 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV back for that WA? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.